Hey, welcome to Mash Talk, the show where we catch up with the most interesting people in tech. I'm your host, Mashable Tech Editor Pete Paschal. This is a very special edition of Mash Talk. I'm super excited. We're here at CES, CES 2019. So I am talking now with Impossible Foods CEO, Dr. Pat Brown. Pat, thanks for coming to the show. Sure, thank you for having me. Super excited to talk to you. Uh, you guys are here at CES, I believe, for the first time. Yes. And I was at your event last night, and you were showing off the new recipe, the new burger, the new, the new Impossible Foods 2. Point, impossible Burger 2.0? Yeah, Impossible um, Burger 2.0. So, great stuff. I mean, I had it, it was delicious. Uh, I had only had Impossible Meat like probably once before. Uh, both times, I really couldn't tell. Like, if you just served me, like it was, it told me it was, it was, it was ground beef. I would have, I would have totally believed you. Um, so let's get to that in a minute. Right, right off the bat, though, you you had said a lot of interesting, some provocative things even last night. Um, I want want you to just let me know, like, what what's the whole raisin detra of the company? Like, what where did you start from, and and well, what is like? There's a lot of reasons not to eat meat. I mean, what is what is yours and what is sort of the, the basis of the company? Wow, okay, lots of, lots of questions there. Uh, the, um, the reason the company was founded was to address, I would say, the greatest environmental threat that uh, humanity has ever faced um, to the viability of the planet. Um, and the overwhelming driver behind that threat is the incredible destructive impact of our use of animals as a food technology, as a technology for uh, turning plants into meat and fish and dairy foods. And um, I would say as more and more uh, environmentalists and even some people in the policy space um, are recognizing um, the use of animals in the food system is by a huge margin the dis most destructive technology on earth. It is, um, responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than every vehicle of any kind put together. Are you, are you talking just sort of the methane from cows or everything in the, in the process? Methane from cows is an important part of it. There are other greenhouse gases um, uh, associated with, you know, there's uh, nitrous oxide, which is uh, um, uh, also a byproduct of manure de decomposition and, and uh, chemical fertilizers. Um, and then there's the uh, very substantial uh, carbon dioxide emissions from uh, continuing deforestation to clear land for cattle grazing and growing uh, soybeans to feed pigs in China and so forth, uh, which is a very significant part of that greenhouse gas footprint. Anyway, the point is there's a huge net greenhouse gas footprint. Um, there's also a huge opportunity cost because uh, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas uh, um, uh, mitigation and reversing the, the uh, threats to the uh, climate and that's because of the fact that uh, the animal agriculture industry currently occupies about 50 percent of the entire land surface of earth. So wow. um, uh, an area that's bigger than North America, South America, Europe and Australia combined is actively in use right now, either grazing livestock or raising feed crops to feed, uh, to feed livestock. Wow. That's land that, that basically because it is um, being heavily grazed or because it's being harvested every year, is not accumulating biomass. It's, it's completely unlike, for example, a forest or, or a natural ecosystem where throughout the year there's a, there's a lot of biomass there. That represents carbon that's not in the atmosphere. If you, um, the fastest way to actually turn back the clock on climate change would be if you could just snap your fingers and, and make that industry go away and simply let the, the, uh, the biomass that originally uh, existed on that land recover, uh, you would um, immediately start actually reducing, not just stabilizing, but reducing atmospheric CO2 concentrations because the uh, rate of carbon dioxide fixation by fi photosynthesis with that amount of land will outpace um, uh, CO2 emissions by fossil fuel uh, burning. So that's yeah. climate change, but that's not the worst thing about the industry. Okay. Oh man, let's, let's, 
And Do tell. So, so the biggest threat actually is that it is the driver behind um, a catastrophic meltdown in biodiversity. That we're right now in the quite late stages of, of this really wildlife apocalypse, I would say. And it's, um, the World Wildlife Fund reported uh, um, this year, and, and uh, they've been doing this on an ongoing basis, that um, the total number of wild vertebrates living on land, or living, living on Earth today, is less than half what it was 40 years ago. Hmm. So in 40 years, we've wiped out half the wild animals living on planet Earth. And that is just progressing. And the biggest driver of that is um, for fish, it's overfishing, obviously. For land animals, hunting to some degree, but overwhelmingly, it's habitat destruction and degradation by um, animal agriculture. And we depend on that biodiversity to keep the ecosystems that provide oxygen for us to breathe, that uh, recycle nutrients when, uh, um, you know, when plants or animals die, yeah. and all those things that keep the planet alive um, to provide a viable biosphere. And we are just on a rocket ship yeah. to biodiversity apocalypse right well, we now. Can, we can we could honestly have a, a, a gigantic show just about all the yeah. environmental things. What you I, what you I push the, the company, button, so there you go. What, what I loved about the company um, is that it's an acknowledgement, because obviously that's been going on for a while. The vegetarian food, vegan food has been, has been uh, that's been a motivator for people to, to, to go in those directions. But uh, you acknowledge that people aren't going to stop eating meat or, okay. or not, not going to stop um, cut cut the, that taste out of their diet. Like I totally get it, but it's also like uh, only so many people are going to be persuaded by this a very compelling. Very case. very few people. I mean, I uh, would say a lot of people are persuaded. Uh, in fact, I, I was at the COP twenty one conference in Paris a couple of years ago. You have hundreds of the world's most knowledgeable and ardent environmentalists, and they all went out to buy steak for dinner. It wasn't because <laughs> they didn't know the problem. Right. It's because it's very very hard for people to change. Uh, something as ingrained as their dietary preferences. And um, so that just is a completely a non You know, China uh, advised the citizens to cut their meat and dairy consumption in half two years ago. Nothing happened. Right. So that's not the solution. And that's, that's, a, that's a country that could actually force the issue. I mean, if <laughs> anyone like can persuade its citizens to do something, I would say it would be the Chinese government. Yeah. And they completely struck out. So I think what that says is that you're, you give up on the idea of solving the problem by telling people to change what they eat. That means that it's a technology problem. It's recognizing that um, the problem is that we're using an incredibly inefficient prehistoric technology to produce these foods. It hasn't improved in thousands of years. Well, I like how you sort of talked about seeing the meat as a technology. Uh, Completely like, a technology. Uh, even what you sort of said earlier, and I'm not sure if everyone caught it, it's that uh, seeing animals like as a, uh, a a vehicle of changing plant matter into, you know, something that we ingest for protein, uh, which is an interesting way to look at it, and sort of how you said, uh, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but uh, uh, but you did say it last night in that if, that Impossible Foods isn't just a technology company; it's the most important technology company today because of all the reasons you mentioned. Do you stand by that? I absolutely stand by that. I mean. We are developing the essential technology to replace animals in the food system, and this is the only way to um, uh, solve the greatest threat to human survival on planet Earth, which is the catastrophic environmental impact of, of the existing technology. So yes, this is, you know, uh, with all due respects to you know, AI-enabled washing machines and you know, uh, all the gadgets around here, they may make life marginally better. We are trying to say, solve the biggest problem on Earth right now with our technology, and that's what really good technology should be all about. And you're doing it with a tasty burger, which you know you got to admire it. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the new recipe 
and just the whole idea of like optimizing, you know, food technology, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, like as you say, you know, ground beef and cows haven't changed in a long time, mm -hmm. but your process can. And uh, first, take me through what the new recipe does that the old recipe didn't, uh, and, and how you did that, and then sort of how you look at that that process, uh, you know, that that optimization of, of food technology. Sure. And and let me just put on the table that that uh, you know a lot of people think like food technology is an oxymoron, but basically all the food we eat today is a product of thousands of years of technology development and research and discovery to figure out what are the things that are healthy to eat and delicious to eat and so forth and how to prepare them and combine them in a way that maximizes that deliciousness and nutrition and so forth and that's still ongoing so there's there's food is technology um, so with respect to what we've done uh, uh, with our new product well when we started working on this we built the best R&D team ever, by far, ever to work in the food industry. We hired uh, more than 100 of the best scientists, literally the best scientists in the world. People who would have otherwise been working at top universities or biotech companies and so forth, who signed on because they, nothing, scientists love nothing more than a really hard, important problem. And there's no hard, important problem, you know, to match the one that we're working on. So we have this awesome R&D team, They've been working on this now nonstop for years, started by building a fundamental understanding of uh, what are the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for the magical flavor and sensory experience of meat. And actually, they found many of the answers. The most important answer is that it turns out that, that the special flavors that make meat unlike any plant and, and, the, and the magic of, of meat when you cook it and so forth is all, all due to a single molecule heme, which is found in every living organism but, but super abundant in animal tissues. And, um, and that's, that's why meat behaves unlike any, any plant tissue. That was early on. When we launched our first product, it was at a point where we had gotten feedback from some of the best chefs in the world that, that they wanted to put it on their menu. And at that point, we felt like, OK, we have a product, it's gonna get better and better and better now until forever, but it's good enough um, to put out there. Um, we had some of the best chefs in the world that wanted to serve it as meat in their restaurants. That was two years ago. We were already working on, you know, making it better. And this is our decisive advantage. This is why I know without a doubt that we're gonna achieve our mission, which is to completely replace animals in the food system by 2035. The wow. reason is that the cow is not even working on the problem. The cow <laughs> did not evolve to be eaten. It's not very good at making meat, and it hasn't gotten better in thousands of years, and it's not even trying. We have the ability to get better every single day, and as soon as we have the best burger that anyone has ever eaten on the planet, the next day we're gonna be making it even better. It's just like with mechanized transportation. You know, when, when the first motorized vehicle was launched um, uh, about uh, 100, 180 years ago, it famously lost a race to a horse, okay? Um, but the point was, it was never gonna lose again because a right. horse was never gonna get any faster. And now you've moved to a technology where you have the ability to deliberately make it better on every axis that matters to consumers. And we're in the exact same place. We can optimize flavor, we can optimize texture, we can optimize juiciness, we can create entirely new flavor profiles uh, that don't have the limitations of just the handful of animals that we we raise for food. Well, the we, other thing you're optimizing is nutrition, and right? Because that was one of the criticisms of the old one is that it wasn't gluten free, uh, as I understand it. But now the new one is. Yes. And how are you able to do that? Oh, it was simple. We we uh, with our first one we uh, included a wheat protein as an important ingredient because basically at that time to launch we needed we needed ingredients that we could uh, um, get. Uh, in quantity from the existing supply chain and so forth. But we knew that, um, uh, you know, 1% of the population has completely intolerant to gluten and we did not want to exclude anyone from our product. So we, we immediately were working on um, making a version that didn't include wheat. That was a relatively easy uh, change to make. I mean, it was a very important change to make. It also improved the uh, protein quality in our burger. But we, um, 
we had a bunch of targets, better flavor, better texture, better juiciness, more vers versatility in the kitchen, the ability to be cooked in any way that you can cook ground beef from an animal, uh, lower calories, lower fat, lower saturated fat. Obviously, it's still zero cholesterol, no antibiotics, no hormones, and, uh, and we wanted to get the gluten out of it. Um, set those goals a year ago, bang. We achieved every single one of them. It's funny to think and we're already working on the next version. Well, this is the thing. I was, I was, it's funny to think of a burger as almost like an iPhone or a version of iOS. Like, you update it every year and it gets better and better. And, uh, you know, everyone just sort of has a fix of burgers is like there's the only variety is like where you go to get it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, like, over, you're introducing this paradigm of over time, you, your food will be more and more optimized. Um, anyway. I know you're starting with burgers and, and I, I presume steaks and, and uh, you know, because of the, the massive cow issue, and, uh, but like uh, long term chicken, fish, pork, bacon. Yeah. So when we started, when we started out, we hadn't decided we were going to work on ground beef first. And, and our research was focused on understanding uh, really the fundamentals behind the whole gamut of meat and animal products, including fish. And only uh, uh, about two to three years in did we make a choice that we're going to, for product development, work first on, on ground beef. But in the meantime, we built a tremendous amount of knowledge, including a lot of stuff that is, you know, patented IP, around um, what are the molecular mechanisms behind the flavor of chicken and pork and uh, fish and just the whole, more or less the whole gamut of animal products. And it turns out, and, and there's real science there. Uh, um, and once you understand it, um, you know, it, suddenly you're in the driver's seat in terms of, in terms of being able to um, tune the flavor profile basically in any direction you want. We just chose beef because it's the biggest environmental problem. Uh, we could have chosen pork or chicken or fish or something like that. And those will be future products. Yeah. But since we're a small company, we have to, you know, yeah. commercial, commercially yeah, focus. And, and that was our choice. Long term though, I'm really curious, like that, you know, you, you obviously with your ambitious goals, like there's, your imagination gets going and I'm like, could, are you thinking about simulating bone and somehow and like, or is that a factor in like we, things like chicken or, or certain cuts of steak and? So bone has not been a priority uh, yeah. um, because although um, chefs tell me that, that the bone <coughs> in some meats actually has a useful function in terms of uh, heat conduction during cooking and so forth mm -hmm. that I would say most consumers don't value the bone right. per se. You just, you're paying for it, uh, but you're not eating it. Right. Um, we're just so kind of used to it as part of the thing. You're I'm used to it. wondering how that's going to play out. And we I'm could, sure you are too. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so right now it's not a priority. It happens that one of our scientists actually did his PhD work on basically the molecular biology of bone formation and uh, so we actually do have some knowledge in-house about how to do it but uh, but from a resourcing standpoint and based on sure. you know our our guesses about what's most important to consumers we haven't prioritized bone cool. if you want bone if consumers tell us they want bone we'll give them bone <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's in it's on the table so to yeah speak. Um, so I know there uh, was some uh, there was a question at least last night, and uh, I wanted you to clarify. So, when you're talking about the soy proteins that you're putting in, um, are, they're genetically engineered, genetically modified. Can you sort of clarify that and why you went that route? Um, so, what you're referring to? So, most of the soy protein uh, 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 in our product uh, that's there for texture and and so forth uh, happens not to be genetically modified. Okay. Not, uh, but 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 we very deliberately. Um, chose to produce what I would say is the magic ingredient in our product, which is a, a heme protein right. um, by uh, engineering a yeast strain to produce it super efficiently at scale. And why did we do that? Because we knew we need, you can't make meat without heme, basically. Heme is the thing that, in, from a food perspective, divides meat from everything from the plant world got to have heme. Right now, the way that we produce most of the heme in the world is by covering the entire freaking planet with cows, okay? A ridiculous way of doing it, incredibly environmentally destructive, dangerous, unsafe, 
Um, we explored, um, uh, we looked at all the potential plant-derived heme proteins. We found one that actually performed better than the one that's found in cow meat, which didn't evolve to be right. tasty. From tasty. <laughs> um, and it was from uh, a part of the root of a soy plant. We spent quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money actually trying to figure out, can we harvest these things from soybean fields in a way that's food safe, that, that doesn't cause a lot of environmental damage and erosion, and that's cost effective and scalable. And after spending better part of a year on this, we decided, nope, we can't do that. And at that point, we decided, okay, what we'll do is we'll take the gene that encodes that protein in a soy plant and put it into yeast cells to give them the ability to produce this protein. Right. Um, it is uh, uh, incredibly, um, from an environmental standpoint, efficient way of doing it. Our scientists have gotten these yeast cells to be effectively, there. It's, it's, it's like an all-time record for getting yeast to, uh, to express a, a, a foreign protein. It's a very tried and true method. It's how all the insulin in the world is produced. So right. every diabetic who's taking insulin is, um, uh, gets it from a genetically engineered microbe. Almost, you know, a large majority of the cheese in the world is, has been produced for decades using a protein, rennet, that's been um, uh, produced at scale by genetically engineered yeast. This is something, this technology is incredibly safe, tried and true already a ubiquitous part of the food system. And so we had zero problems with embracing it. It was, it was absolutely, from an environmental standpoint, scalability, uh, food safety standpoint, the right way to do it. Right, makes sense. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would say like, uh, have you seen, I, I, I was just kind of wondering if you had seen uh, that Nestle and others are sort of getting into this and one of, Nestle I think named it the Incredible Burger. Are, is this, is this sort of at a point where, um, you know, all competition is welcome? Um, yes, I mean, I would say we, uh, you know, the industry that, that we were found to replace is going to be uh, worth about $3 trillion a year in revenues in 10 years, okay? Um, it, it would be ridiculous for us to say, no, we just want to take, take the whole thing. And it would be, a in very inefficient and self-defeating way to try to scale our technology to, to solve the environmental problem, which is the whole reason the company exists. We would welcome other, uh, um, other companies um, working on the same problem. It happens that um, because we have, um, because the critical ingredient in making meat behave and taste like meat is, uh, something that we have IP on that's proprietary, we have a patent on it, um, uh, I would say no one else can make meat that really behaves and tastes like meat. Right. It's just like a biochemical barrier that can't be breached. And we've put a ton of research into this, so I can say that with high confidence. Um, but if other companies are making products that, that meat eaters choose to eat instead of meat from an animal, my feeling is they are allies, they're not competitors. We're yes. not interested in taking their customers away. I feel like, bless your heart, you know, keep buying, any customer that likes those products should keep buying them. Uh, we're going after the 99% of customers that are still buying the cow version and are not interested in any of those plant-based products. Um, so it's, 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 it's a real mischaracterization uh, and certainly we don't think of it internally as any, anyone else who's working on this problem is a competitor. They are people who are on the same mission with us. Cool, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thanks so much. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'd love to check in with you again in a few years and see where you're at and sort of uh, getting close to that mission. Oh, yeah. I have a few more burgers yeah, on the way. Yeah, that's great. Cheers, man. <laughs>